came up with. I love to run and I just love to be part of running and it is my addiction to share that with everybody. So I decided to come up with Rima, which is running is my addiction to help get as many people involved as running as possible and just help people. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Don't mind me, I'm just taking mid video. It's okay, for we're good. I like, I like video. <laughs> can't see anything anyway. Nice and dark. It's 5.30 in the morning. I don't know why we're up doing this, but we are. I couldn't do this alone. I mean, I have a great backing, what I call his goats. I mean, a lot of people are familiar with the goats, which is the greater, greater Omaha area trail runners. They're always there. The people are just, I mean, like family. You ask them for one thing, they're there just like crewing and pacing. Anybody is there to help out. And I mean, I had a, a fantastic bunch of uh, pacers and crew members when I did uh, all my hundreds. It's just something it's, that I love to be around. And I know with the support of everybody who has either was there to help me train, run long miles at Hitchcock or SRAM or Cunningham, where I was running, people just love to just come run. And it's the support of the community. and. This uh, organization is, I couldn't do anything with, without them. So it's just it's so fun to be around these people. Trying to, starting from my disease, it's called biliary atresia, and I was diagnosed as a baby. Um, it was my bile ducts were not formed properly when I was born, so they had to go in and do a procedure called the Kasai, which is reconstruct. Uh, my bile ducts, which has gone fairly well since birth. I've had three or four uh, episodes with it, and what happens is uh, my bile backs up into my system, makes me itchy and jaundice, and makes me tired. And with the disease, I'm, I don't want it to hinder anything I do, but it's just I want it to kind of push and inspire people that anything they have like disease wise or doubts about themselves they can get up and do it so i've been dealing with this for 45 years nobody else can do it i mean it, i don't let it hinder me i know people have other issues other problems in their lives that they think is just horrible horrible but if you just take that first step and get out and run and it's not an excuse not just run but just put one foot in front of the other go to a treadmill go to a gym just start doing something so that's kind of what I want to do with with my disease just show people you know what don't let it stop you just go out and do it put one foot in front of the other and get started I get up, I do my routine, have my bagel, my peanut butter, and just listen to some motivational music. And then I did probably a minute and a half video, just out of the blue of just the surreal of, this is the day I've been waiting for since I found out I was in the lottery in February. So it's been building up this time. I knew it was, it was go time. It was, I was trying to get focused and I had an hour drive from where we stayed to Salt Lake City and I just relaxed and focused and I knew I had 36 hours to get this done and I was gonna do what it took to get to get done. Park City. We're already in Park City. I know but we're I mean we're leaving. Heading to Wasatch. Yes. How do I turn this thing around? Can I? I think so. No, I'll just do it this way. Okay, this is us. We're going. Heading to Wilderness Park for start of Wasatch 100. Paul's in the bathroom, so we're ready to go. This is us going. 
Okay, I'm heading to the car. Here we go. Beautiful morning in Park City for the start of Wasatch 100. Oh, been waiting for this one for a long time. Uh, since I found out I got in the lottery in the 1st of February, so it is now September 7th. Four, three something in the morning. We got a 58 minute drive to the start line. Give me plenty of time to relax and think about what I need to get done today, which is run 100 freaking miles. So we are out. So the first 50K is pretty much on your own. You're relying on drop bags. That's what makes it probably one of the toughest races because it's all on your own. I mean, you have to rely on things you packed in drop bags and, and doing it all self-sufficient. So everything I packed in drop bags was very strategic as what I was going to need until I saw my, my crew. Wanna move my feet, wanna drop my one, wanna move my feet, wanna drop my one, wanna move my feet, wanna drop my one, wanna move my feet, wanna drop my one. Wanna move my feet?
And when you see your crew for the first time after a 50K, it's like, it's very exhilarating. And you're like, okay, I get to finally pick somebody up, keep me company. I listened to a lot of music during that first 50K, took a hard fall, uh, hurt my chest, lost my my Fitbit somewhere along the trail because my, my fall hurt me so bad. So I was really looking forward to the first time I saw my crew and everybody that was there for me. It was when I came down the mountain and they were there. It was like, okay, now I feel a lot better. I'm ready to get focused again. Hitchcock was pretty much my go-to place, just the elevation up and down at Hitchcock. I mean, I know <clears throat> I ran endless 15 to 20 miles out there, and I'd put one 26-mile-plus <clears throat> run out there one weekend. It's just the elevation climb, and I did a lot of SRAM, and <clears throat> just you can do a little different run at SRAM, a little quicker run. But Okay. Regroup. I know I'm going out with Dave, but it, it was just starting. So excited to have Dave with me, but we knew the, the fun was just starting with the wind and the heat and the climbing and just having somebody there to talk to and keep me motivated was great because it was, it was hot. It was, that was the ho hottest part of the day, probably some of the toughest part, just the climbing and the heat. And one of the other challenges of that part spot after I picked up Dave, we had a long stretch between an aid station. And people in my crew and my pacers have warned me, hey, make sure you take enough water because you're gonna run out of water, it's gonna be hot. And I was good on water, Dave and I were doing well. And I mean, some of the views that Dave and I, I mean, got to experience, I mean, there was this one point we were up this mountain and we, we looked right and we could see a lake off in the distance. We knew it was coming when we got to the top. And once we got to the, the top, I think Dave turned on his camera and we were talking and I, I think I remember said something about Hitch being just, thank you for Hitch and being doing everything to get me prepared for that race. But just the beauty of Wasa, that's one of the reasons I love running in the mountains. It's just, because every time it seems like you climb one hill or a mountain and you stop and you just, this, just the, the pure uh, view of everything that you've been working for, know what's coming. Two waters. Both of them? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Just water? Yeah. Yeah. Just water. Over there? We have goober. It's Do you want one goober and one water? Yeah, that'll work. Okay. Good work, mister. Seven or eight till the next one, or? No, we have five. Five? Five on this one. Actually, I don't think it might be a little bit. No, no it's probably five. A little bit under five. Don't be bad. Woo! It's good work there. The, the A station, I pick up Paul, which it's getting uh, 4.35 later in the evening, and I know the fun is, I mean, it's just starting. It's gonna get dark, it's gonna get a little chilly. And some of the climbs we had, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was probably a three or 4,000 foot climb in probably five or six miles. It was just straight uphill. And we hit an aid station where my feet were starting to bother me. And that was one aid station I totally forgot to pack socks. And my socks were just kind of wet and dirty from the miles from the last aid station where I changed them. 
and all I did was take my socks off and put new, I re which was good, but it wasn't good enough. So by probably mile 55, 56, my feet were just killing me. And I started to develop blisters. And that's when my feet were just hurting so bad, it was hard to hit any, even rocks. And I probably hit one of the darkest spots of the race. It was, it was just hard to run. So I made that until the, uh, the next aid station where I got to see my crew again at mile 64. It's dark, I'm in that hole, my feet are just hurting so bad, it's just hard to run anything. And I know I have to get this taken care of because what they say about Brighton Aid Station, it's inside, it's where people go to die after an ultra. Because it's warm, nobody, you sit down and you don't want to get out. So I, I sit down for 20 minutes, I had this wonderful doctor, I think, who comes over with this chest and he says so you got blisters and I said yes so he just he takes my shoes off my socks off and he just goes to work on me lances my blisters bandages them back up puts socks on for me and I feel rejuvenated because knowing from then I get 36 37 more miles to go before I finish but little did I know it was still so much more to come <laughs> My last pacer, Jimmy, who, uh, I mean, I, I say, just go on endlessly about how Jimmy just helped me get through this race. I mean, it was just a start of endless climbs and ups and downs, and it was dark, and my feet were still kind of hurting, and it was, the, the terrain was just a mess. I mean, we ran into, ground it was like sandy running in sand and we ran into rocks and we had to climb rocks and we think we would get through one climb and there would be another climb and it was it was endless and Jimmy I think Jimmy and I spent a total of 14 hours plus out to finish my last 50k which is crazy but he dug, we dug deep there were times when Jimmy would just he would be on me to just eat my gel drink my water and the next time he was just so motivational, he would say, okay, we got this. And I know at one point I was very serious. I was in a deep, deep hole and I looked at Jimmy. I said, Jimmy, are we really gonna get this done in 36 hours, which was a cutoff. And he looked and said, Matt, we're gonna have to hurry. And that's when I knew, I was like, I, had, I have to get that done. So it was a battle. So coming up, uh, the last point, we know, well, funny story about this, I mean, we were, we came out of the last day station, which they say was like 5.4 miles to go, and it seemed like we were just going for miles and miles, and we got passed by another runner, he said, yeah, when you get to this bench, 
it's a mile to go. So we're, Jimmy and I are both like, all right, all right, we're looking for this bench, looking for this bench. And we see this bench and it's got a flag on it. And we both looked at each other and we said a mile to go. And I think, I know he reached out to everybody at the finish line and said, okay, we're a mile to go. And then probably a quarter mile down the road, we run into this lady coming back the opposite way she was coming from the start finish line she said yeah you have like two point something miles to go and Jimmy and I almost looked at each other and said we were done we were ready to just cut through the lake and get to the finish line but coming around you come out of the mountain and you get on a highway and you can see the flags and just you can in off in the distance you can hear people cheering and that's when it, it started hitting me that's when I saw Dave with his camera and I was like okay I'm getting this done I'm almost there, and it, the, the celebration and the tears all were, were starting to come, and I knew I was going to get it done within a, a lot of time, so it, it's all coming to an end. lined up and I see I see Paul I see Michelle I see Dave I see everybody there and, and, and I know every year because I did a little research on watch that and the race director is always right there at the finish line giving hugs and I, I knew as soon as I got to that point he was standing there and I looked at the clock and it read 33 34 I knew I got it done I gave the race director a big hug and then I Join the rest of my crew and pacers and it, it just, I mean, I got so emotional because it is a wreck up and down. It's a roller coaster ride because you, you just go through so much turmoil in a hundred, something like that. It's just, and the jubilation and knowing you've worked so hard to get it finished and completed. It's just, it's hard to explain. But it's just, I want everybody to experience something like that once in their life. So my takeaway after, I mean, after finishing something like this, it's just, like I said probably earlier, it's just exuberation and just knowing that you can finish something if you put your mind to it. I know people are always have doubts in their minds and their hearts if they can even do something like this. But you know what? If you put your heart and your mind into it and believe in God and the people around you that will be there to support you and put in the training. I mean, it it's hard work, but nobody ever died from hard work. It's just something you have to have your mind 100% into. It, uh, I tell this story to a lot of people. I mean, trail uh, trail running 100 miles, is it's gonna beat you up. I mean, your legs are gonna hurt, your body's gonna hurt, but it's that grind in your mind that is gonna push you over the top and just knowing 
your support crew and everybody you will have in your corner is going to be there for you. And I just, I say, you know what, if somebody, if you think you can do it, or if you even want to do it, just, just try it.